Thanks for your right now. <laughs> All right. Um, so thanks for, for having me here today. I'm really glad to, um, to be here. I'm always glad when I get the opportunity to interact with different students across the university and kind of see what's going on um, in the full spectrum of what we're doing here um, at the university. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and then I'll talk, start talking to you about um, the topic that I'm talking and bringing to you today. Um, so as, as Anna said, my name is Jennifer Lewis and I'm, I'm an associate professor in the Graduate School of Business. I've been here at Notre Dame University since 2011. I was in the first group of faculty members who came to start the university. So this is my sixth year here um, at the university. So I'm really um, proud of that fact that I was part of the original group of people here and really have seen kind of our educational process from the beginning um, through now to where we have you know, PhD programs and lots of graduate programs and things like that that we didn't have um, at the very beginning. And so I'm really actually really glad to be here in this class to kind of experience what you all bring to the university. Because um, as you've been talking about education, it's not, from my perspective, it's not just one-sided, it's, it's a community of learners where we all learn together. Um, so Anna and I have come to know each other, as she said, through the last um, year or so, year I guess, um, just through a number of different initiatives that we have going on here at the university. Because we are both, I think we both consider ourselves scholars who focus particularly on issues related to gender. Um, so my PhD is in communication studies. In communication, I focus specifically on political communication and leadership. Within that area, I study women as political actors and as leaders. Um, in particular, how people perceive them. So what's the perception of women politicians, women as they're running for office? So um, for example, in the US right now, I have a field day with all kinds of research that's going on um, with our first major female candidate running for president. Um, and so, so that's where I started my research along the lines of gender. Um, and then I moved into women as leaders because obviously politics is one small area, but we can look and expand that into um, women as leaders in general more broadly. Um, so that's where I study. I focus on issues related to how um, people are perceived as leaders, what are the characteristics that are necessary to be a good leader, um, because I'm in the Graduate School of Business, I focus on that within business and organizations. Um, and then specifically, I look at differences among women and men. Are women perceived differently as leaders? Are, they, are there different skills, different competencies required from women than from men, um, and why? So those are some issues that I look at. Um, as an educator, however, the issue of gender and education has come up and has been part of what I've um, experienced myself and then also what I recognize as my own experience as a teacher um, too. And so when Anna asked me if I could talk to you about something related to um, education, I thought, well, what could I, what could I do? Because I don't particularly study education. Um, but then as we were talking, I realized that sure, my background in gender certainly helps me just kind of maybe see issues related to gender in education because that's the world that I'm in. Um, that maybe I wouldn't have seen otherwise. And so hopefully today I'll have the opportunity to share with you um, a little bit about that um, idea, that concept, and also get your ideas, okay? get your thoughts, get your experiences, because we've all experienced um, these things a little bit differently. So I always like to start with my central claim. And so the central claim that I'm making today is that formalized education, like most or all other social institutions, is gendered. Okay, so I don't have any problem making this claim. I believe that the research backs it up, and I believe and hope that today I'll be able to talk with you um, and help you to hopefully come to that conclusion as well. Um, so there's a couple of things that, with regard to this claim, I'm gonna go through today so that hopefully we can um, unpackage this, describe it, and see it in depth. And I've given you a couple of readings, a couple of really basic foundational readings that will maybe illuminate some of this for you, help you to see some things maybe that you hadn't seen before, or help you to um, have, a, have a word or have a phrase for something that you've seen before, but you didn't have a way of, of, um, of, of putting it into a package. You didn't have a way of claiming it or pointing to it and saying that's what it is. Um, so this is my, this is my <coughs> claim, that, all, that, that our formalized education system is gendered. And I lump it into not just the formalized education system is gendered, but that almost all other social institutions are gendered. Um, I, I 
Personally, I would say all other social institutions are gender. Um, I know there's a lot of other scholars out there who might say most all. Um, so I kind of left that a little bit wrong, but if you're asking me specifically, um, as from my point of view in scholarship, I would say that all other social institutions are gender. So this gendering does a couple of things in particular. One, I would say that this gendering is fundamentally unavoidable. So we can't avoid gendering within our social institutions, um, but we can recognize gendering within our social institutions. So it's not necessary, necessarily saying that this gendering is bad, um, or that we can stop it, but that we should be able to recognize it and then make a choice with what to do about it um, at some point. This gendering also fundamentally changes the education that we receive as receivers of education, and that also it fundamentally changes the education that we provide. So as providers of education, this gendering process changes that um, education that we provide. Okay, so as I'm making this claim, one um, important note here, I'm not making a claim whether this is good or bad or right or wrong. I'm just simply making a claim that this is the foundation that we start from. So don't necessarily think automatically when I'm saying that this gendering is bad or that it's good. I'm simply making a claim that says that our educational process is gender. Right? And that that's unavoidable, but that we can recognize it, and then we have choices to make based on that. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, let's, uh, just to make sure that we're not trying to be biased immediately with this question, because I know a lot of people, as soon as they hear the idea of gender, they think, oh, no, I don't want to go there, right? But instead, what I'm saying is that it's so central that we must consider it first, and then consider all the other outcomes as a result of that. So that's my, that's my perspective. So this is what I want to describe to you today. Um, this is what I want us to talk about. So I first of all need to, to start with some sort of background to help you understand um, what I mean when I'm getting at this idea of gender. And I do this in all of my classes, um, in all of my talks, because I don't want to assume that we all have the same understanding of what it means to be gendered. Um, and so I want to make sure that I kind of lay that foundation out there for us so we can start from that particular perspective. All right, so with regard to gender, basic, basic statement number one, humans are gendered. We are gendered creatures, right? It's, it's part of who we are. We carry our gender with us into all of our interactions. As a communication scholar, I see us as social creatures. Um, I would make the claim go so far as to say that we are only social creatures, that everything happens through our interactions with one another. That's how society is built, that's how we as people are built. Um, so we carry our gender with us into all of our interactions. Um, we can't help it, we can't deny that we do that, um, we can't avoid it, it is part of who we are. So this is one of my claims, that we're gendered and we carry that with us into um, our interactions. As I've already mentioned, I do also see gender as a social construct distinct from biological sex, okay? Um, and so why I say that because I come from the perspective that gender appropriate behaviors are learned and they're really learned within society themselves. So what is appropriate for someone who claims one gender is different than what is appropriate for someone who claims another gender. Um, and then those are social constructs. So let me give you a basic um, example to help you with this. When a baby is born in a hospital, what color do we generally put girls in? Pink. And what color do we generally put boys yeah. in? Blue. Why? <laughs> is there something that makes a girl pink? Yeah. It's considered kind of. Is there anything that says that because she's a girl, she must be in pink? <laughs> is there anything inherent about her biology that says pink? Yeah. No. no. Right? We've socially decided that girls should be in pink and boys should be in blue, right? And we've, we've all decided this together, right? Again, not good or bad. We're just saying we've all come to this agreement when, when you have a nephew or a niece who's born and you want to buy a gift, right? You wouldn't 
buy blue balloons for a little girl, right? Because gender is socially constructed, right? And we've determined that pink is for girls, blue is for boys. So then we pass that on, right? We pass on those beliefs, those constructs to other people through, in this context, a formal process of education, right? But parents and society as a whole pass that on to um, other people, right? So maybe you had this experience. I have an older sister. She's two years older than me, and I have a younger brother who's eight years younger than me. So my sister and I would be playing when we were younger, and my little brother was like two at that point in time. You know, I was 10 when I had a point in time. And, so we could do anything we wanted to him because I was 10, my sister was 12, and he was two, right? He had no choice, <laughs> right? So maybe I wanted to play dress up that day and I put him in a dress, right? <laughs> yeah, you're like, yeah, this has happened, <laughs> yeah, sure. Right? So when that happens and my mother walks into the room, what does she say? What, are, what, what, would, she, how, what would her reaction be to my brother being dressed as a little girl? Yeah. What would she say? Just give me some examples so, of what she'll say. It's proper to dress a boy like a girl. Right? Yeah, and you shouldn't teach him. Like, if you dress him like a girl, he will think that this is okay. It's okay. Yeah. Right. So, that's, yeah. so my mom said, why did you dress your brother like a girl? <laughs> he shouldn't be wearing a skirt, right? He shouldn't be wearing a dress. So then I learned that that's not appropriate clothing for a boy, and that's not appropriate clothing for a girl, right? So, so we learn those things because someone tells us, not because I inherently know that girls wear dresses and boys don't, right? Because if we all knew it, then how would we explain this? <laughs> right? Traditional dress, yeah. acceptable clothing, right? Society in Scotland <laughs> has not necessarily said that this is only acceptable for girls, right? So it's a social construct that we've learned. Different societies can see it differently. Does that make sense? So when, when we think about gender as a social construct, our, what is considered a gender appropriate behavior is learned somewhere along the way. Right? And we all learn um, certain, certain behaviors, what you dress like, what your hair looks like, right? Boys have short hair, girls do not. We learn that somewhere along the way. So our gender is something that is socially um, constructed. Um, they're learned, learning occurs through social interactions, right? So that interaction with my parents, the interaction with other people, those things are all part of my, my learning of what's appropriate for my gender. And so as people, we have established several social institutions that in and through which we navigate so these social institutions help us to kind of make sense of our world. They help to regulate the world that we're in, right? So I've already said that education is a social institution. Have any other examples of social institutions that we have? Places of worship. Say that again. Places of worship. Yes, good. So places of worship, religion itself is a social institution. Great. What else? Politics. Politics, yeah. What are some of our fundamental... Mm. Walks. Education. Education, yeah. yes, yeah. Family is a social yeah. institution, right? Mm -hmm. Family can look different from society to society, culture to culture. Right? That's a social institution. What it means to be a family is something that we construct, right? We socially construct that to say this is family, this is not. So I know um, I know when I'm talking to some friends, they'll say, Oh, well, my sister, blah blah blah. I have some friends from Kazakhstan. And then they look at me and they say, Well, it's not my sister, it's my cousin, but I call this person my sister, right? That's a social construct that you have that's different than me, right? So in my very individualized American society, we have clear distinctions of who is who and how they're related to one another, right? In Kazakh society, it's very different, yeah? Your, your mom's best friend's daughter can be your sister, right? Because you grew up that way. That's your social construct of family. So within those social institutions, we navigate our lives, and those are major influences in what we, in how we learn gender. Okay, so that's kind of a, a foundation for what I'm talking about when I say gender is learned. It's something that we um, 
that, that we experience and that get into more things can be fluid, can change throughout throughout life. But it's one of our it's our fun it's I think it's it's one of our fundamental distinctions um, is that humans are gendered. So this kind of gives us the the basic jumping off point into this idea that education is gendered, right? So I've already made my central claim that education um, is one of our, as a fundamental social institution, is gendered. So I start with the idea that society is gendered. So if society likes to break us into genders, which we know that society does, we take part in this. So if society is gendered, we're thinking about it in terms of education, that means teachers are gendered, right? That means students are gendered, right? And so if we can continue that on down, that also tells us that our knowledge is gendered. The things that we know, those things are gendered. Again, not good, not bad, not wrong, not right. They just are gendered. And so it's up to us as educators to understand, well, what does that mean then? How does that influence education? How does that influence us as teachers? How does that influence our students? Um, you know, how, how does that change what we know and what we don't know when we think about the idea that knowledge is gender? So I think if we, if we can start with this understanding that knowledge is gender, that should tell us that knowledge is not neutral. Right? There's not just knowledge that everyone knows or that isn't, doesn't have some sort of twist or some sort of um, gender to it or bent to it. It's not neutral. When we teach, when we pass on knowledge, we pass on knowledge that's gender. It's been through the filtering process of gender, right? So I've got it from someone and I'm passing it on to someone. It's coming through several different filters. And so I have to recognize that it's not just knowledge. Right? I don't believe that there is something just, just knowledge. It's knowledge that's been filtered and in this case filtered um, through through um, some sort of, of gendering that's been socially constructed. Um, and, and I'm gonna give you this one example, because if, if knowledge um, isn't gendered, then there are certain questions that we wouldn't need to answer or we wouldn't need to ask. Um, but for example, um, last year, this was um, a question that was asked here at the university. One of our student groups, Chirac Club, was asking this question, what is or should be the role of women in society? Okay. Well, if knowledge was neutral, then we wouldn't need to ask this question. We wouldn't need to be pondering, well, what should the role of women be in society? What is the role of women in society? Right? It would just be, I just do something <laughs> because that's who I am in society. But because knowledge is gendered, we need to ask these questions. We, we need to consider and question and, and ask these sorts of things. So there's actually a very interesting discussion. Um, if you want to get more into it, I can share more with you. I'm going to move on <laughs> from what this topic and this uh, particular um, discussion was about. So moving farther into um, education itself, um, I think it's important for us to consider a couple of different areas with regard to gender and education. And some of the readings that I gave you really went into some specifics on some of these, and I'm just gonna talk more in general and let you explore the readings on your own, right? Um, so that we can maybe just look at kind of a bigger picture of what's happening here. Okay, so one way that education is gendered is through our educational divisions. So we've made several divisions in education that for some reason society has just decided that we should, we should have. Um, again, right, wrong, good, bad, I, I don't know. But we've made divisions in education, and that those divisions have forced certain knowledge for one segment of society or for the other, in particular when we think about educational divisions. So for example, in many schools, I believe still here in Kazakhstan, um, there are different courses that girls and boys would take. Boys might take something like woodworking or electronics or something like that. Girls would take home economics, cooking, laundry, maybe not that far. Um, maybe sewing, is that still somewhat common? True. Yes? Okay. So, 
At school? At school? Craft. Craft. Craft? You big, yeah. Craft. So I was a metal worker and girls were sewing. Okay, so you did metal working, girls did sewing? Cooking. Yeah. But you Cooking. Did you did you cooking. choice, I mean. It's not about choice, yeah. Right? What do you mean it's not about choice? You don't have a choice. You <laughs> don't have a choice. You yeah. must take that, right? Yeah. That's what I mean by an educational division, right? Someone has decided, some, someone up here, right? Not us individual teachers. <laughs> someone has decided that this should be the division, right? And what that has done is that it's limited the knowledge that girls have and that boys have, True. right? So now you don't expect that boys know how to sew because they've never been taught. Not because they're not capable of it, but because they've never been taught how to do it, right? You don't expect that girls know how to do metalworking, is that what you said, right? Not because they're not capable, but because they've never been taught. They've never been given the opportunity because somewhere along the way, we have gendered education and we have divided what is knowledge for one gender compared to knowledge for the other. Does that make sense, what I mean by educational divisions? Again, not saying that this is the right or the wrong thing to do, but just that this is the state of our education, right? So the question then becomes, which we'll get to later, why and should that be the case, right? And that's where, as future PhDs in education, you should be considering these questions. Should this be our educational system? Should this be the way that we want our education divided? Right? You could say yes, or you could say no, but it's the question that needs to be asked. It's the question that needs to be considered because usually we just go about our educational process and don't even think about, well, why, why are we doing it like this? Why have we divided education that way? So that's one way that education is gendered in educational divisions that we've made. We start to see that as well in um, not just necessarily artificial divisions like cooking or sewing and metalworking, but we start to see that, and your readings brought some of this out, in um, things, like, things like sciences and like hard sciences and social sciences, right? Where more, more men tend to go into hard sciences, math, physics, things like that, more women go into social sciences, humanities. Um, even within the educational system, we see divisions where we have more teachers at lower levels who are women, but as we move up the organizational chart, we see more men who fall into the administrator ranks, right? So we have some divisions that have happened um, for whatever reason through, through society culturally that we start to see that we're, we have gender divisions within the educational um, process as well. So educational divisions is definitely one way that we see gender um, coming into play. Um, another way is through expectations of students and teachers. So we start to have certain expectations, and your readings talked a little bit about this, certain expectations that we have from students and of students and from and of teachers themselves as well. And those a lot of times come down to gender. Um, so for example, student behavior. We have certain expectations of little boys and certain expectations of little girls when we get into classrooms, right? And I'm talking little classrooms. For some reason, it, it's easier for us to see it in those terms of, of little kids, right? So we expect little boys to be um, more, uh, what we would call fidgety, movie, right? Like we expect them to be sitting in their chairs and to be moving around a lot and to have a lot of energy, right? We might almost let them as teachers get away with being a little more noisy, a little bit more rowdy. There's been even research showing um, that they take up more space, just men in general take up more space. And we allow that. We allow for them to take up more space. Maybe if it's on a table, this is my space as a boy, right? And then the little girl, we expect her to sit nice and tidy and close, right? Some of that, you're like, what? <laughs> some of that happens too when, when, we're, when we're little, right? Um, and some of that is a function of, of clothing that we wear. If I'm gonna, like today, if I'm sitting down at a, at a chair, I'm not gonna be sitting with my legs spread wide apart, right? Yeah. I'm wearing a skirt, and when I was young, my mother told me that girls don't do that, right? So I sit more compact. Little boys are never told to do that, right? So we have all of these things that we've 
socially learned that then move us into the way that we interact in the world in particular. So student behavior, we, we have certain expectations, certain things that we are accept, that are acceptable for boys that maybe aren't acceptable for girls, right? We tell girls, you need to be nice to each other, right? If the boys fight, well, they might get in trouble for fighting, but it's okay if they're not nice to each other, right? The little girls have to be nice to each other. So we have different expectations of behaviors that we would want from students. Um, and then we also see that coming out too in, not just in that case, but also in the, the ways that we describe students or the ways that we describe people. So I'm gonna give you these examples that come from um, our, our student awards. So every year we have some undergraduate student awards that the student government puts together. And they put out calls saying, we have a student of the year, a senior student of the year, freshman of the year, man of the year, woman of the year. So I want us to look, um, and I know it's gonna be hard because it's small to see this, um, but here's our picture of the man of the year. Sorry, Anna, I know that probably messes up the video. Okay, man of the year is given to a male student who's made a great contribution to the social life of Nazarbayev University. He can be involved in the social life through any possible alternatives, being a member of student government, head of a club, an individual activist. He's actively participated in organization of university events, solving student problems, the person who makes every day life of the students easier, more interesting, he's able to motivate others, and then qualifications, male undergraduate student, GPA 3.0. Okay, that's our description of a male student of the year. Sounds like a very studious person, right? Someone who we can all depend on. Here's our description of the lady of the year. This award is given to a female student, beautiful both inside and out, who demonstrated outstanding involvement in the social life of the university. She might be a leader of a charity club, dance club, active member of any student chapter, but the special thing about her is the surplus of positive energy that motivates everyone around her. She actively participated in organizations of various events, fairs, meetings, campaigns, or concerts. So what are some of the differences that we see here? Beautiful. Beautiful, okay. So in the second line here, female student, her first quality. Beautiful. Beautiful, uh -huh. right? So is this a student of the year? Or is this a beauty pageant, yeah. right? Yeah. Do we do we want do we want a beautiful male? No. 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 No, no one cares. No, we care less. Right? Ugly or better. That's <laughs> 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 You're real bad. A real man, right? He doesn't take care of himself. <laughs> so the first thing that we see, the first thing that we see about the male student is that they should have made a great contribution, right? The first thing that we see about the female student is beautiful. Inside and outside. Well, at least it's not, not outside, outside and inside, inside <laughs> right? At least we put that in the right order. <laughs> so we, we start to see some, some contrasts in our expectations of who would excel as a male student of the year and as a female student of the year, right? So we see here um, the way that they've been involved in social life. Member of student government, it's important. Head of a club, an individual activist, has participated in an organization of the university event solving problems, right? Male characteristics, yeah? I, I, I look at this as somebody who studies leadership and I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Those are all things that a leader should do. She might be. She might be. She, she, she might be might a leader. Be. leader right? no. our, our, our lady of the year does not need to be a leader. What does she need to be? Patient, charity. Beautiful. beautiful. She needs to be beautiful, but she might be a leader. And of what kinds of clubs? Charity, charity, charity yeah. Yeah. dance, any student. What what kinds of clubs are these? Who who usually cares about charity clubs and dance clubs? Social. They're social clubs, right? They're not okay. student government. Yeah. People who solve student problems. Yeah, we get to some of that motivate people around her, participated in campaigns, um, but of course her positive energy is really important, uh -huh. <laughs> right? So, so our expectations of male students and female students are simply different, right? And we see that coming out when we get examples like this. I love giving examples like this. Because to me, it's like, oh, there you go. Thank you. You've proven my point. I can just walk away. I don't need to say anything else. Right? Because sure. these are, again, these are social constructs. And I'm not saying that this happens.
happens over here, this would happen in America too, and I would shake my head at it there as well. Okay, this happens in a lot of places because we can't escape gender. It, it's, it's who we are, and we've been socially um, constructed, socially biased in a certain way to see things one way or the other, right? Again, not that right or wrong, just pointing out what our expectations are. So, here's our man of the year, here's our woman of the year. We have additional uh, student awards. Freshman of the year, senior student of the year. So freshman of the year, this award is going to be given to a highly active first year student. He. 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 Sounds like he. <laughs> senior student of the year. Senior student of the year has shown exceptional, exceptional leadership and personal qualities and has proven himself. himself. Right? We've gendered this automatically. But but it's it was so the people who are writing they were Russian speaking and we don't have this differentiation in Russian. This. Thank you for pointing this out. Student of the year. Do we see the same distinction here? No gender specific. No, no, no. This one has not been gendered, right? Not been in, in the way that we're thinking of, yeah? So there is a way to write it where we try to avoid that gender. But not yeah. in Russian. Right, but these aren't written in Russian, they're written in English. No, no, yeah, I mean, but is it a way to avoid it in Russian language? No. There is if, yes. you, if you are more inclusive, right? So if you don't just limit it. Because you have, like, in German, Every word has gender. Right. Yeah. So you could you could include both, is what I'm saying. Right? Okay. So you could include the male and female version. It uh -huh. makes it really clunky. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right? But you can. Yeah? So it's possible to. Mm -hmm. okay. So what we've seen here is that it is possible. We just have to be aware of it and try to make a, a diff try to do it differently, right? I understand it can be hard to mm -hmm. do that, yeah. But we can, we can, if we're more aware of it, then we can try to make it um, a little bit different. So I use these as examples so we can kind of see that progression of how these things happen, and then how that limits our way of thinking um, when we think about gender. So, so it 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 influences behaviors that we expect from certain students. We expect female students then to be involved in charity. We expect them to be beautiful inside and out, and expect them to have that as one of their primary um, areas of focus, right? We expect male students then to be the leaders, to be the ones who are focused on problem solving. It becomes our expectations for those students of what super appropriate student behavior is. We also have other expectations that come into the form of, and your readings talk some about this, teaching styles, classroom interactions, and teacher evaluations. Um, and I'm, I'm aware of our time, so I want to kind of pull all of these together. So teaching styles, classroom interaction. We expect, there's certain expectations that are gendered. We expect our male teachers to be more strict. We expect them to be more logical in the way that they approach things. If a female teacher is strict, then we're like, what is wrong with her? Her teacher evaluations have been shown through research that her teacher evaluations will be lower because she takes on a more masculine form of teaching. And that's a form that we don't expect from a teacher. Just last week, I had this happen to me. One of our new students in the graduate school of business, um, I had come back from traveling. We've been in the US for a couple of weeks. And the next day, I needed to do a couple of things. I was really trying to get focused on a bunch of stuff and didn't have time really for kind of social interaction. Hi, how are you? Right, it was one of those, I just needed to get some things done. So I interacted with him and then went on. A couple of days later, I happened to see him at a cafe and I was like, oh, hi, how are you? We were much more casual and that sort of thing. And he said, oh, is everything, is everything better now? And I was like, what do you mean is everything better now? And he said, well, a couple of days ago, you, you know, you're, you're always smiling, and a couple of days ago, you weren't. And I was like, I wasn't smiling? Like, I didn't, I didn't realize, I'm sorry. I didn't know that I was not smiling or that I was smiling. And so he, he pointed out to me that his expectation for me as a 
a woman is that I should always be smiling, and that when I'm not, that something's wrong. So that's an expectation that he had of me. And so and we look, when, we, when we look at studies, we see teaching styles, classroom interaction, the way that a, a, a female professor or a female teacher teaches should be more emotional, should have more care for the students, right? If a teacher, if a female teacher says, no, I'm not going to accept that paper late, because that's the rule, that people look at her and they think, what? You should be, you should, you should care more about me. The male teacher, however, we don't necessarily think that. We expect him to be strict and stern on this sort of thing because he follows the rules, right? We wouldn't necessarily try to play to his emotions, although sometimes, sometimes we can't. So teaching styles, class interaction, and all of that leads to the way that teachers are evaluated. And we have a lot of um, a lot of data on this, particularly at the higher education level, where we do teacher evaluations, right? After every class, you get an opportunity to evaluate your teacher, how that class was, how the professor was, and all of that sort of thing. But we have a lot of data that shows that women and men um, argue differently when it comes to the way that they um, that students evaluate them in their in their classroom evaluations. We even have some pretty um, recent um, data that's come out with a couple of studies that have been done using online classrooms as, a, as an environment where we can manipulate gender. So a couple of recent studies have, have put students, obviously, in different sections, have the same teacher teach them, but in one section they believe that the, that the teacher was a man, and in the other section they believe that the teacher was a woman. Right? So, so this is online. online. Purely online. online. They have no idea who the teacher is, right? So in one instance, it's the teacher Jennifer Lewis, and then the other instance is the teacher Jason Lewis. But it doesn't matter because it's the same person who's teaching the class. Who do you think gets evaluated higher? Man. Man. The man, even though it's the same teacher teaching both classes, when the knowledge is that it's a man, a male name, the ratings are higher than if it's a woman. Do you have statistics, so it's just the only case? Yeah, so there's been a couple of uh, recent articles that have come out with this sort of finding, but these are very new because we're just being able to manipulate these sorts of things in online teaching environments, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we, have, we have a lot of evidence that supports this just um, in the general classroom, but we've never been able to do it where we can hold those things really constant and not be able to have any bias that's in there. Really interesting results that are seen. Um, as a result of some of these things. So we have expectations of students, we have expectations of teachers that are gender, right? So they, they exist, they're part of who we are. In many ways, we can't really um, escape them. So then, the questions that I've been talking about so far, I've really just kind of been addressing this idea of, of just gender, right? Um, but gender can become problematic when it becomes bias, okay? So I, I don't believe that we can escape gender. I don't believe that we can escape these gender issues. From my perspective, um, as an educator, I, I think that our concern should be, is our gender bias influencing our teaching or our learning? That's where we need to be concerned about, it, right? We, we have lots of data that's gonna show us that it's there. Gender is there, right? But the question is, is it influencing our teaching? And is it influencing the learning that's happening? So one of our main questions that we can ask as educators is, are we aware? Are we aware of the way that we're gendered? Are we aware of the knowledge and the way that the knowledge is gendered? Um, so one of the articles that I gave you was talking about teacher education textbooks and how teacher education textbooks are highly gendered and how they don't necessarily um, deal with issues of gender, they don't bring them up, and they don't prepare teachers on how to deal with these issues in their classrooms. And so if that's the case, then how, how do we even, are we even aware of the way that our education is gendered, the way that our teaching or our knowledge is um, gendered, and potentially bias um, one person, or bias in one way or another? And then the other question is what can or should be done? What can be done about this? And what should be done about this? So as I teach, um, teach a class in gender and communication, as I teach that class, I always tell students, I hope, I hope to persuade you that th something should be done, because that's my perspective, that something should be done, right? I am not ashamed of taking that, that perspective.
but I realize that some other people might have different opinions, right? They might say, no, I don't think anything should be done. I think girls should learn sewing and boys should learn metal working, right? But my question is, have we even thought about it? Have we even discussed it? Have we determined if this is influencing our teaching and our learning? And the reason we need to do that is because of this question. Are we teaching an entire topic or are we teaching only the part that's been approved? So are we teaching all of something to people or are we only teaching part of something? So historians deal with this a lot. Um, history is written by people in, I think you guys talked about this a little bit, people in positions of power, people who have voice, right? Those people who have voice write the history books, yeah? And so we're, so we're teaching only the part of the story that they had told us that they'd included in the books, right? Well, is that, in this case, we're thinking about it in terms of gender, or leaving things out? Again, the readings that, you talk, that, that I gave you talk some about that. Are we leaving out significant contributions by women in science? Because we're not putting them in the books. And so that makes us believe that women haven't made contributions in science, right? I, I brought this question up. I used to be in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, and I brought this question up because if you go into their building, you'll see a number of, the, the Kazakh language and literature program is in um, their school. If you go into the building, you'll see a number of posters all around the wall of these great people who have contributed to Kazakh society. Men. Men. Right. And I said, have women not made any contributions to Kazakh society? I find that hard to believe. We're only choosing to highlight the men. Are we leaving out parts of the story? Are we leaving out knowledge that we should have that could maybe change the way that we're thinking, right? So is our knowledge limited by our gender? I only know what I've been taught or what I've learned, right? Is that knowledge limited by gender? So I talked to my husband about some things and maybe I'm, women have a lot of um, special, what we call special lexicon, special vocabulary that we've learned because of our exposure to certain things, right? So women have, five different colors, five different words that you can use for the color green, right? Men have green, right? Because they, they haven't been exposed through fashion magazines, through watching television, through sewing, right? But no, it's not green, it's, it's olive, right? So we have different colors that we can use. And is, is your knowledge limited by your gender? And has our educational system led to that? Has it led to my limited knowledge? I would say, yeah, if we're splitting up, if we're splitting up education, if we're saying these people should know this, these people should know this, then it could be that it's limited by our gender. And then is our knowledge biased toward or away from gender inclusion? So am I biased or is it what I'm wanting to, um, to include, is that, is that knowledge biased? toward including lots of things or away from? Is it limited toward, um, is, it, is it wanting to create more division or is it wanting to create more inclusion? More connected bits, more connected or shared bits of reality, right? I don't know as much about metalworking because I've never done metalworking, right? But my husband really likes to work on cars and because I like learning things, I, tell, I ask him to tell me about working on cars. So when he's working on a car, I'm usually sitting there learning a lot of things, right? And so people, men in particular, are surprised by my knowledge of automobiles and the way that they work because I've decided that I want that to be part of my knowledge. And I have someone who has said, okay, sure, and who hasn't said, well, that's not something that a girl wants to know, right? That's not, oh, you don't need to know that. Instead, someone who said, okay, sure, I'll tell you because it's knowledge that's out there in the world that you can know if you want, right? So if we think about our educational system and the way that we have to make choices, right? Knowledge is infinite. We have to make choices about what gets included and what doesn't get included in, in education, yeah? We can't, we can't include everything in eight months of, of, of an educational year, but are we limiting that, are we limiting those choices of what we include? because of gender or based on gender? And are we biased toward or away from gender? That would be my big question, especially for you as you're considering and thinking more on the decision-making basis, becoming an educator.
indicator, um, what are the decisions that you're making? And are you making those decisions because of gender? And are you necessarily limiting knowledge because of your gender bias or because of others' gender bias that has influenced you? So that's the those are the main things that I plan to talk to that I plan to talk about today with relationship to gender and education. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions or have a discussion. I don't know how much time, but Anna suggested about 45 minutes, so that's what I gave you. <laughs> and um, I'm willing to talk. I'm open.